thanks so much for joining us for this session. Uh, my name is Julia Guy and I'm a grad student. So I'm working towards a master's in digital humanities and library and information studies. Although now after seeing all the cool stuff going on elsewhere, I'm, maybe I'll change programs, who knows? Uh, so our presentation today is discussing online instructional videos, best practices and leveraging analytical data. So before we begin, we wanted to quickly acknowledge that although we're all spread out today in different places, uh, we work and live on Treaty 6 territory, Métis Region 4, uh, which is a gathering place for Indigenous peoples, including the Cree, Nahiawak, Blackfoot, Nakota Sioux, Iroquois, Dene, Ojibwe, Soto, Anishinaabe, Métis, Inuit, and others. Uh, and uh, we keep getting influenced by their histories, languages, and cultures uh, in positive ways. We also wanted to recognize that copyright, which is the topic of our presentation and uh, our instructional videos, is a Western concept and it is hugely incompatible um, with uh, Indigenous knowledges um, and cultural expressions. So we wanted to recognize that and uh, share our hope that by contributing to copyright education, we can help reveal some of those issues in the future. Uh, so today I'm presenting with Dr. Michael McNally who is an associate professor in the Faculty of Education. And we have worked together along with Luke Fagnan from the School of Library and Information Studies and Amanda Wuckeruk and Adrian Shepard from the Copyright Office to put this presentation together. Uh, so I am going to uh, give an overview of the project just to give you some context. Uh, so um, about opening up copyright. So it is an instructional module series uh, about Canadian copyright. So the goal of the series is to increase people's understanding about copyright in a bunch of different contexts. Uh, so we hope that these videos can help people find materials and resources they can use and understand the ways that they can use them uh, and also empower people to make the things that they create more openly available and accessible to others uh, while maintaining the controls over how they want their works to be used as well. Uh, the project was funded through a Tea Leaf grant, the U of A OER grants, and SACS grants have also funded the series. Uh, so in terms of the videos and their content, um, there's quite a range. Uh, some modules cover really specific scenarios, um, like the one in the top right corner there is interlibrary loans and controlled digital lending with the puppets. Uh, and that one uh, is very specific to kind of a library context and is sort of meant for library staff and users to explain those kind of um, initiatives and concepts. Uh, other modules give overviews of kind of larger uh, kind of issues, less specific. Um, like the one in the top left, for example, is open licensing and creative commons. So that gives an overview of the open licensing spectrum, including creative commons. Uh, other modules are even more focused on specific court cases and sections of the Copyright Act that help non-lawyer folk like myself sort of demystify um, what copyright law is and how it's interpreted by the courts. Uh, so as you can imagine, this stuff is dry. It is so dry. Uh, and uh, it's also very hard to keep these videos short sometimes because concepts and copyright often build on each other. And so when you introduce something new, you kind of have to give background information. And so things can end up getting a little bit long winded. So because of this, we try our best to make things as engaging as we can. Uh, we try to include characters and narratives um, with problems to solve, like Sandy there on the left, uh, who is a character in our Makerspaces module. Uh, we also try to incorporate interactivity. So we do that using H5P in WordPress so that people viewing can have test questions. They can click on links, little text bubbles pop up that are all clickable just to build interactivity. Uh, we also try to use a variety of characters with different ages, ethnicities, gender identities, just to make them a little bit more relatable to a bunch of different audiences. Uh, and then lastly, we also have uh, sorry, community pages, which are just on the right there. Uh, so every module has an accompanying um, community page where people can provide feedback, uh, give us ideas for other modules, put in questions. And so as we build the modules, we try to reference those and incorporate any feedback that we have been given, just uh, as another way to increase engagement. Uh, so uh, there are some best practices that we are working from as we build these modules for creating engagement in educational videos. 
Uh, and they're based off several different studies. And so those are having learning objectives and kind of explicitly stating them at the beginning, using scripts, uh, including interactivity, avoiding jargon and chunking content into smaller sections, avoiding large text filled blocks, uh, using a conversational narrative and keeping videos short. So we do pretty good at the first six, uh, less good at that last one there, which uh, Michael will talk about a little bit more. Uh, so last kind of key uh, component about the project is that it is open. So uh, in, dis in addition to making things engaging, we try to make them reusable and openly available. Uh, that was very important from the onset of the project uh, that we follow best practices for open educational resources. Uh, so we provide transcripts and slide decks uh, that we use to build the modules for every single one so that people can take them and adapt them uh, for their context or institution even. Uh, so why open? Because we can. Uh, the goal of the project is to provide copyright literacy resources and have them used and adapted as widely as possible. Uh, so now Michael is going to talk a little bit more about the analytics. Thank you, Julia. Uh, so being as open as possible means not using E-Class. Uh, so E-Class has a lot of benefits for instructors of courses, and these modules are uh, intended for use within some of the classes within the School of Library and Information Studies, but they're also designed as part of the university's copyright literacy initiatives. And so while E-Class can get some detailed analytical data, uh, YouTube has as well really rich uh, set of analytics. And that's in part because of the commercial nature of the platform uh, that's, uh, that it serves. Uh, so while there may seem to be a bit of a contradiction between promoting open content and relying on technology from one of the largest technology companies in the world, uh, we've actually explored that elsewhere in another paper and some of the tensions between openness and commercial content. Uh, I'll also note though, that uh, YouTube provides a lot of different uh, analytical data in themes like reach, engagement, audience. And so in the case of this project now, which is up over 3000 views uh, and uh, you know, lots of hours of watch time, we're able to get different uh, slices of the data that can inform how we can best reach people. So for example, from this uh, set of data here, we're getting fairly clear information that people are watching on computers and not mobile devices. And so we know that uh, for the copyright videos, prioritizing design for computers is, uh, is still working well as a, an approach. Uh, also the YouTube data can be downloaded. Uh, so you can collect uh, various uh, files in CSV format. Uh, the one limitation to note is that you cannot download an entire data set that would have all of the data for all of the videos, uh, but you can uh, build back fairly specific data sets, finding out you know, to which date uh, each particular view of each particular uh, occur, uh, view occurred on. And so you can get some really rich uh, data, but it's really the viewer retention data that we'll look at that's quite valuable. And I also wanna give a nod out to Jamie Stewart, who's in the audience. Uh, he was involved in this project at the very early onset. And he was the one who suggested, uh, if you're going open and you wanna reach people, combining H5P for interactivity and YouTube for reach and discoverability was the way to go. And uh, thank you very much, Jamie. And I'm hopefully glad you get to see some of these uh, results now. Uh, so just in terms of who's watching, uh, we do know that most of the traffic comes from the University of Alberta, most of that coming from the Opening Up Copyright website, which is a part of the Copyright Office's website. But we can also see that we're getting external traffic from a range of other post-secondaries. The, uh, the brightspace.com, which makes up uh, you know, about 12.9% uh, of our external views is actually Desire to Learn, so it's other learning management systems. But we see Laval, University of Lethbridge, UNB, Capilano University, they're also using these modules. And so this is very valuable to know that uh, not only are these open uh, educational resources being used here, but they're being uh, used by other post-secondaries as well. What's really, I think the, the important piece here though, is this viewer retention data. And so this is, uh, we've taken data from our top 10 most popular videos, all of which have more than hundred views and uh, graphed it in terms of how much of the uh, percent of the videos watched uh, versus how much of the audience is retained. And so most of these videos are about uh, six to eight minutes. So as Julia noted, we really don't do a good job on the three to four minute range. But looking at this data gives some real interesting stories. Uh, the first of which is that you can 
uh, have a uh, hundred over a hundred percent audience retention at some points, and that comes from a rewinding function. And what we've done is we've put learning objectives as an optional pop up right at the beginning of the video. Uh, that's the case for every single video, and so we can tell uh, that you know hundred plus hundred percent at the beginning is people actually starting the video, missing the pop up, and going back then. Uh, in most cases, to uh, to get that uh, learning objectives right up front. We do know, though, that uh, the, all of the videos suffer from this incredible drop off at the very end. And if anyone has ever watched a video, you get an uh, optional knowledge quiz on copyright at the end to reinforce some of the learning objectives and key content in the video. And then there's a series of uh, credit slides, uh, acknowledgements for various images, licensing information, uh, a lot of technical kind of credit-like material. And as you can see, uh, that is often the least engaging part of the video. And in some cases you have nearly 50% of people uh, disappearing right as soon as that pops up. Uh, there are also a series of spikes in the, uh, the data, and those are basically rewinding points where people are going back. Uh, is, as you can see, there's lots. And so just out of the YouTube data, you can't necessarily tell um, what all of those are caused by, but we do know in some cases. So this is uh, the largest spike in the data set. Uh, it's from one of the more popular videos, photocopying in the library, and we can see here... That little pop-up is quite engaging, uh, but on the whole, this is the, the log time for that video. It's the longest video at 12 minutes and it's actually the least popular. So we are able to know that that six to eight minute range, uh, we've done fairly good job of keeping most of the, the audience in most of those, but longer videos, even with puppets, not very engaging. Um, Notably, we have two videos that are an FGS for our requirement for grad students, uh, including third party content in your work and publishing agreements. And of course, being a required video, obviously they uh, retain a lot of their viewers, which is I think uh, good to know. Uh, on the flip side as well, uh, the least popular of the most popular videos is uh, in terms of engagement is a video on moral rights. And I think this is an interesting stat because this is the second most popular video by views, but it's actually not very engaging. And so I think that's important to keep in mind that views really doesn't tell the engagement story. Uh, and in some cases, data doesn't tell the whole story. This video here is other types of intellectual property. I have no idea, you know, maybe it's a suggestion we need an opening up innovation series. Uh, we did include a little gremlin character in it. Uh, perhaps that is what, we were joking how uninteresting that subject was and perhaps that's what kept, has kept people engaged. But uh, really just to kind of conclude with, uh, with this, looking at this data, you know, the big takeaway from all of this is that uh, if you follow most of those best practices in video design, most of the time, most of the people will watch most of the video. And that's a lot of most, uh, but I think it really underscores that those, uh, those best practices are, uh, are quite well-founded. So uh, again, uh, thank you very much to, uh, to Julia and all of the colleagues on the project and uh, happy to, uh, to answer any questions in the uh, discussion.